Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're just going to wait a couple minutes for our guests to join. Okay. Good morning again, everybody. Um, my name is Bahar Agu and I'm a freshman at Emory University. I'm currently pursuing a major in biology and a minor in English on the pre-med track. And this will be my third year in the UNCSW and I'll be moderating this panel today. I'm really excited to be here with our wonderful panelists. Some of them I've worked with before and I'm really excited to have everyone here. Uh, we'll be having our Q&A session at the end, so if you have any questions, you can direct them to Sueda Polat, who's also on the Zoom here today. Zehra and I will be starting off the panel. Uh, Zehra, Zehra Ozemir is a high school sophomore at Fulton Science Academy. She is interested in pursuing an art degree in the future. Zehra was motivated to work on a project for the CSW to be able to better understand the experiences of women worldwide, and in her free time, she enjoys art, skating, and reading. Together, we'll be discussing women taking on roles in the fields of media in Turkey. And I will share my screen for our presentation. Okay, is my uh, presentation visible? Okay. 2018 was the third year in a row in which Turkey had jailed more journalists than any other country in the world. Courtney Rash, the advocacy director for the Committee to Protect Journalists, said to ABC News, Turkey has really cracked down on the independent press by equating journalism with terrorism. It's no surprise that Turkey also has the most female journalists behind bars, and 14 of the 68 journalists jailed are women, some of whom are serving life sentences over anti-state crimes. Today, we will present to you the situation of Turkish women in journalism who work in misogynistic cultures and are targeted for their descent. For many years, female journalists in, Tur in Turkey have been targeted simply due to the fact that they are rejecting traditional feminine roles in a male-dominated state. They are subject to sexist insults and attacks not only by state security forces, but also by their own coworkers and bosses. Such displays of violence are heavily based on derogatory remarks in order to display supremacy. And in this environment, natural life events like marriage and pregnancy, they're not treated with respect and understanding, but instead they're seen as setbacks or negative influences on their career progress. Many women actually have to quit their jobs early um, simply because the burdens of motherhood are placed solely on their, on their shoulders because of stagnant cultural norms. And these are events that should be celebrated and praised, but instead they're seen as distractions and incapability. And not only are they set back by such instances, many reports have stated that simply due to their gender, women working in media have been subject to severe mobbing, discrimination, psychological, and verbal abuse. According to a report published in 2018 by the Journalist Union of Turkey, 61% of women reported experiencing intimidation, 59% bullying, and 17% actual physical violence. And many cases have been reported where female workers experienced ostracization by the shoving and jostling of male colleagues. Gülfem Karatash, a journalist and news commentator says, I don't know any journalist working in the field who hasn't been subject to violence from security forces. And we all have to deal with violence, but the actions against female journalists are based more on derogatory and sexual remarks and display and a display of masculine supremacy. And to top this all off, female journalists in Turkey do not receive equal pay for equal work. This is not very surprising, considering the fact that Turkey ranks 85th out of 187 countries where equal economic rights for women are concerned. And the harsh reality is that while it may not all be intentional, it has become an inseparable part of their job. Despite such difficulties, many female reporters push to keep their jobs and excel in their fields, even when they are constantly burdened by oppression and inequality. While the experience of journalism has always been one in which Turkish women have been sidelined or forced to work 
uh, in misogynistic cultures, the authoritarian tendencies of the government, particularly its repression of free speech and the press, has created an environment in which any individual's fundamental liberties are endangered. So to better illustrate the working conditions of these Turkish female journalists, I would like to give some examples of them who have faced exile, unemployment, arbitrary imprisonment, and strip searches. So let's begin with Sevgiya Karcheşme, who was a political journalist and editor-in-chief at today's Zaman. Unfortunately, this newspaper was closed by Erdogan's executive order and arrest warrants were issued for many of its staff. In our interview with her, she mentioned that it was difficult for women in to attain the same positions that men did in the workplace and that journalism was heavily male dominated. She also mentioned that female journalists could face sexual harassment at work. Next, um, I would like to talk about Arzu Yildiz, who was a Turkish reporter who mainly worked at independent news outlets because of censorship in the mainstream news. In our interview with her, she mentioned that especially before she started working at independent or online platforms, her relationship with her male colleagues were very tense. Um, for example, when she first became a mother, um, she would get insults at her workplace by her male colleagues on how she couldn't accomplish as much as she did as a mother. Um, <clears throat> one male journalist explicitly dismissed her capacity to report as much as she did. She also mentioned that hiring and promotion within Turkish media is heavily tied to connections one has. Obviously, this is unfair for everybody, whether they're male or female, but Ms. Yildiz believes that it is especially more difficult for women, particularly minority women, who already have trouble rising to the top in the workplaces. After publishing pieces related to the December 17 government corruption probes, Arzu was frequently slandered on social media and these insults often took on a very sexist form. She recalls she was referred, she was referred to as sexually derogatory terms. Some posts claim that she only got access to sources by providing sexual favors, which is an accusation rather common among successful women. In our interview, um, she made a remark that genuinely stuck with me. She said that the way people harass and insult a person is a reflection of their internalized values. The insults she suffered point to a very misogynistic culture. She also pointed out that her experiences were very similar to Ashton and Pearl Ducks, which I will talk about afterwards. Arzu did lose her right to liberty in Turkey when she was reported when she reported on the Turkish intelligence agency's weapons transferred to Syria. With a warrant issued for her arrest, she had to leave behind her children and flee Turkey. Now, Ayşenur Pırıldak was a law student and a court reporter for the Zaman newspaper. She was unfortunately um, sentenced to seven years in prison on allegations of membership in a terrorist organization. When she was first taken into custody, social media was rife with threats of sexual violence, some even suggesting that raping her would be justified since she was a terrorist. Puddledock said about her time in custody, and I quote, I have been beaten and sexually assaulted. I was questioned for eight days, day and night. They were drunk as they were questioning me, and they were not afraid to say so. In her letter, she says at the beginning of her imprisonment, she was only given one hour of access to fresh air, although it was later increased to four hours and then to eight. She says that she spends those eight hours with other inmates who are also in solitary confinement like her, and she spends the rest of her time alone in a six square meter cell. Ashuna Pırıldak last said that she was afraid of being forgotten. When the Turkish state deems someone a terrorist, the government directs the aggression of the public towards that individual. In a patriarchal culture in which sexism is unfortunately the norm, this aggression frequently takes the form of litany in sexual insults, rape threats, and slander. The policies of the current administ administration have made it extremely difficult for female journalists to do their job with genuine integrity. While the cases of Ashina Parodak and Arzu Yildiz are pretty recent, they are by no means um, isolated incidents. At this point in time, Turkey is the largest jailer of journalists, a good many of whom are female. Women face unhygienic circumstances and violations of their fundamental rights, such as strip searching when imprisoned by the state on arbitrary charges. This is a practice incompatible with human dignity, yet it is, yet it is practiced indiscriminately in Turkey to target to target political prisoners. Many women have opened up regarding their experiences with being abused 
and violated in jails. Lastly, I would like to talk about Sedifa Uruç, who was yet another of many targeted Turkish journalists. She had dedicated herself to reporting on the conflict between Kurdish militants and the government in the Sur district of Diyarbakir in 2016. Her colleagues who had been working on the same issue that she intended to, in to inform the public on the forced evictions in the area. Due to her political work, she was arrested on charges of membership of a terrorist organization, similar to the rest. Sherifa was detained for roughly two years in prison and her trial is still ongoing. She made important claims about the prevalence of strip searching in Turkish prisons, a practice that the government denies, and I quote, Today, strip searching is widespread and arbitrarily imposed in all Turkish prisons where inmates face beatings. The government's claim that there is no naked search in an, is an effort to, to torture in prison. Unfortunately, yet predictably, the complaints she filed went unheeded and the incident was covered up by the authorities. Journalism is not an easy field to work in for Turkish women. Difficulties, difficulties come in the form of both workplace environment and government oppression. Change will not come unless both the regime and the culture undergoes reform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zehra. Um, I think it's really important to hear such stories because we give these statistics and we give these numbers, but with these stories, it really brings us back to the fact that these are these are happening in real life and they're happening to people and it's really I think it's really important to hear these personal stories in detail. Next we'll be hearing from Kiran Nazish who is the founding director of the Coalition for Women in Journalism, a worldwide support organization for women journalists. Ms. Nazish is a longtime journalist and she worked as a war correspondent covering the Middle East, South Asia, and Mexico among many places. She is also a distinguished professor at Brandon University in Canada. Go ahead, Ms. Nazish. I think you're muted. That always happens. Um, so thank you so much um, for this very important conversation. Um, and I'm glad that you guys are doing that, you know, at, um, you know, from the big, like it, at the university level to try to understand um, the dynamic of how women in the media work in Turkey. Turkey is one of the very most, one of the top three countries uh, where we frequently document uh, violations and attacks. Um, and I know that in the beginning of the presentation, um, I think Zahra mentioned um, how Turkey is one of the top jailers. Turkey is also globally the top jailers, um, jailer for women journalists. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about myself very briefly about you know, how um, the Coalition for Women in Journalism started and why um, our focus is greatly on Turkey. We have uh, the most staff in Turkey as well because um, it's one of the most important countries for women in, in journalism. Um, so I, I have been a journalist for since 1999. Um, I started my career in Pakistan where I grew up and was born. And um, from then onwards, I cover any post 9-11. I covered some of the major wars of our time in the last two decades, which includes Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and then other wars that are that were simultaneously going on in tertiary um, and uh, covered a little bit of, you know, Mexico, the drug cartels there um, and Syria eventually as well. Um, and uh, during my career as a woman, um, you know, first as a journalist in Pakistan, which is uh, one of a key Muslim countries, um, and which has similar issues to Turkey in terms of misogyny and media and press freedom as well as gender equality. Um, and then covering, um, you know, the rest of the world, um, um, I noticed how women were, it was difficult for women to work in the industry within the newsroom as well as outside in the field. Um, and of course, this is a knowledge of all of these years of covering different parts of the world where realizing that when women journalists are violated, um, there are very few organizations that document where there's very little media coverage. Um, I know at the beginning of this conversation, we discussed a little bit of the data um, as well, um, I think. Um, and uh, in that data, there is a lot of 
cases of women journalists that are not documented globally. So uh, anyways, fa fast forward, I, um, in 2017, I started as because I've been a journalist and investigative, investigative journalist, obviously what journalists do is to find out why cases of women and uh, when women journalists are violated are not documented. Um, and I we did a survey um, uh, with um, in, in, in 100 newsrooms um, in North and South America. And we found that 65% of the times when women journalists are violated physically um, because of their job, um, their, um, their violations were not documented by, by local media and then eventually by international organizations. So I, um, I launched the Coalition for Women in Journalism and we have seven chapters. It's a global organization and we work in uh, seven different countries with chapters, but then we also document violations, monitor cases and report on them from 92 countries around the world. Um, in uh, 2020, which was the latest year before 2021, uh, we documented over 900 cases of violations against women journalists, which is um, more than three cases per day. Uh, which includes holidays and um, weekends. Um, we in February, which was our latest report with, before March, we documented almost 3.5 cases per day of violations against women journalists. Um, this does this does not only include the online campaigns against women journalists, online violence, which is something that we're familiar with um, in the industry of how women, when women go online, uh, there's online violence and trolling, which can be uh, very horrific at times, uh, which targets women in particular and more aggressively. Um, with gendered attacks and all that, which is a huge issue. But then we also document uh, imprisonments, detentions, physical attacks against women journalists, um, as well as murders where women journalists have been murdered. Um, this year alone, we have documented four murders uh, of women journalists. Um, now coming a little bit to Turkey, Turkey is, uh, as a, me as a foreign correspondent, I covered Turkey for five years. Um, I was also covering Iraq and Syria. Um, and so I was going back and forth from Turkey into these countries, but Turkey had been my base for a long while, uh, which included the time when the coup happened, the coup, uh, the most recent uh, coup attempt in Turkey um, under Erdogan, after which there was a huge, um, you know, there was a huge massive blackout of journalism itself because the coup attempt essentially allowed the current government. I'm going to assume that we all understand that in Turkey, press freedom is repressive under Erdogan. Um, today is one of those days where we have seen, you know, physical violence. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. But, um, but uh, you know, after the coup attempt, it sort of gave... Uh, a certain leverage to, you know, Erdogan's um, government to repress the press. And we saw massive violations of press. Uh, newsrooms were shut down. Journalists were put into prison. There were raids against uh, in houses of journalists all over the country. And specifically um, in the southeast part of Turkey, where um, you know, Kurdish, uh, in the Kurdish majority populations, we saw that there was a repression that was, that all also went undocumented because of the censorship that is happening in Turkey. And a lot of times it is very difficult for journalists who are, um, you know, journalists locally cannot document a lot of these violations. And then, um, and so they're not documented locally, but then foreign journalists who can report on these violations are also limited because they don't get press credentials, their access is limited, um, they're not allowed to go there, and if they do go, they are at risk of getting deported. So there is a mass, in the in the last six, seven years, there has been a, an even more greater uh, repression of the press, which is, I believe, going you know undocumented to a great extent. Uh, we document violations against women. 
this includes um, sexual, you know, assaults uh, and sexual violations against women in the newsroom uh, or sexual harassments, which are not directly related to the job, but also uh, obviously how the state represses um, journalists. Um, Turkey is one of the top three countries where we document violations against women journalists. Um, there is a, it's one, it's after Iran and Saudi Arabia, Turkey is one of the greatest, uh, uh, largest jailer of women journalists. Uh, if I were to give you numbers, we uh, do timelines and uh, timelines of each case of, you know, uh, imprisonments or violations against women journalists, which you can check on our website, uh, womeninjournalism.org. Um, and on that website, you will also find a trial calendar. And our trial calendar essentially is uh, how every case of why, you know, how women journalists are going on trials repeatedly. Um, and it sort of is like a calendar where you can see who has a trial this month. And in January, we had five trials of women journalists. Uh, five women journalists were going to trials for different kinds of reasons. In most of these trials, we cannot find um, any reason or evidence that the government provides um, where women journalists, uh, why they are going through a trial. Most of these trials, uh, you know, accuse women journalists of terrorism or so their association with the terrorist group and so on and so forth. Um, so in January, we had five trials. In February, we had eight trials. Um, and in March, this month, we have nine trials. Um, and I also want to mention on Women's Day this month in March, um, one of a very senior, but also elderly female reporter uh, wa was going through trial and they sent sentenced her for six years and she's elderly. Um, another way I think that there, there, there are certain tactics where Turkey uses um, to repress press freedom and how they target women because it's, a, it's an issue. Women in a very misogynistic kind of culture, women, if they are targeted with gendered nuances, sexual, you know, sexualized context, uh, they feel abused personally. And we see that Turkish state uses that tactic to personally attack them so that they feel violated genuinely internally in their bodies and their souls. Um, and uh, we see this when, when any kind of, uh, you know, online trolling campaign takes place. Um, as well as we see that in court proceedings when the trial is taking place, we, we monitor each trial and we are mostly present and during trials to listen to you know, what, the, what is going on in the court. And we see constantly that state prosecutors use sexualized um, verbiage to um, you know, get women more affected by you know, how they're targeted. Um, and what the state wants to say and all that stuff. So it's essentially to demoralize them and cause disrespect. Um, just very quickly, I would also mention that today um, there is, uh, as you know, that the Istanbul Convention, um, there were demonstrations based uh, off the convention that Turkey sort of backed from, backed off from. And um, during those uh, demonstrations, we, as always, were monitoring uh, how women journalists were documenting it and if there were any safety situations. And um, our team was also attacked by police um, physically um, while, you know, doing the monitoring. So I think that um, Turkey, every time there is any kind of situation going on in Turkey, it's um, it's there is uh, certainly a gendered nuance and also that we feel that Turkey is one of the most difficult countries for women um, in the media to work in, whether it is within the industry, where the industry, there is misogyny in within the media industry, in newsrooms as, as well, um, but then also, um, you know, the state uh, particularly targets women journalists, whether it is to get them to trial or when they're covering protests. Thank you so much, um, Professor Nazish. Um, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for the work that you do because the the news and the news and like the stories and stuff that we hear that are online, these are the documented parts of it. These are the ones that have been, you know, been able to be told into the public. But it's crazy to think about all the stories that can't be told because of fear and repression and just for a number for a number of other reasons. So, thank you so much for the work that you do. Uh, up next, we have Kezban Karagöz. 
She is a Turkish journalist with a PhD from Istanbul University College of Journalism. She has previously worked in advertisement, advertising as a script editor and a project director for culture, arts, and corporate communications. In 2017, she began lecturing at the Yeni Yüzyıl University Department of New Media and Journalism as an assistant professor. Currently, she provides consulting services to organizations regarding influencer communication, fighting post-truth publications, and content creation for civil society. A member of the International Federation of Journalists, Karagöz also writes opinion and news pieces for Turkey's Egos newspaper. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, everything. Um, this is also so bad day uh, today because, as we know, uh, Istanbul Convention uh, letter uh, last night. Uh, I don't want to say that is the uh, we don't uh, want to this convention. Uh, we together is the alone <laughs> about the human rights. <laughs> uh, this is uh, so so hard the uh, night uh, last night. As I talk about uh, again, then um, maybe first of all, is that the uh, whom uh, women write about the churches? Uh, so little as a perspective is about the maybe in the churches problem at the women, especially women. Later, maybe talk about the uh, women uh, journalists. How about this? And uh, and the Turkey and the five uh, problem or uh, five uh, point in the Turkey. And uh, this is a femicide, you know, is a so so high in the Turkey these days. Uh, a lot of uh, women died in the street. It's a so so, uh, so so big problem for us generally uh, because of uh, gender based and the domestic homicides and the are often refers to as the honor killings uh, in Turkey, you know. Uh, honor, uh, honor killings is a very big um, uh, problem in Turkey. Like a uh, so normal, uh, this is uh, is the honor. Yes, you can die the a woman, <laughs> like a joke. But woman is a diet in the Turkey. This usually rhetoric is that women are uh, equal to men, and the, that women without children are the, the deficient members of the Turkish government have also publicly encouraged verbal harassment of the woman wearing shorts. Maybe you are wearing the shorts in the street. Yes, maybe you can buy it because you wear a short. This is, uh, this how about, I uh, understand. But a lot of women, you know, uh, wear a veil, wear the scarf, the, with scarf woman that died again. And the, but uh, government use as the uh, um, maybe a problem that you are short. And uh, other things, the femicide in the Turkey on rise because Turkish government has admitted not keeping the records of the violence against the women, but Turkish feminist group, you know, maybe this is the new uh, movement. We will stop femicides, uh, reported that 300 women died killed by men uh, in the 2020 and uh, 171 uh, women especially did in the 19 2020 and mostly did the hands of relatives or partners and generally government say that to us uh, family is so important yes family important but Women died uh, uh, hands of the relatives of the part partners, maybe brothers, maybe uh, husbands, maybe and um, yes, maybe that. This is so big problem in the Turkey these days. And the uh, legal framework and there uh, has been let to protect women. You know the Istanbul Convention uh, in the twenty eleven became the first country to adopt the Council of Europe Convention of Gender-Based and the Domestic Violence. But, however, or law enforcement really, really followed these basic laws. You go to the uh, law or the court, uh, generally uh, courts, remember, don't, uh, don't believe your, your words. Uh, Maybe men go to the same court, 
um, and you know where the maybe jackets and only this jacket with the jacket uh, you look to your jacket yes you look like a very good man but you maybe uh, not important your violence and in the turkey this is this uh, this uh, not problem the turkey uh, generally this law protect the man not woman this is the very very big problem in this turkey and the female empowerment yes uh, female empowerment the less let the woman in the turkey achieving and you know economic independence in the turkey and uh, mm, this is a huge step okay huge step but uh, as it gives the woman to ability to exercise uh, their rights and um, uh, leave abuse the relationships problem relationships and the women are also more like to work low wage uh, jobs or to be employed in the informal sector with a social security maybe you know, women go to the clean job you know maybe go to the baby as maybe as a babysitter only not have a inform information job maybe not go to um with um computer job or as a maybe is that not teacher uh, not academician not other job only very deep job and uh, the last and the last one in the turkish government particularly encouraged the gender-based violence yes this rise of the female independence has led to what feminist secular you know maybe say uh, this uh, name is the fatma gulbektai cause a crisis of masculinity masculinity crisis yes this is big problem these days because um especially in the um, big uh, the metropolitan city is the istanbul or the izmir or ankara adana antalya like and the uh, uh, women come uh, come to this big uh, city uh, from the east uh, uh, country the uh, east city maybe diyarbakir uh, maybe urfa uh, the, you know uh, the urfa diyarbakir very uh, strong patriarchy come from this the big city to izmir uh, to istanbul or to ankara maybe adana or antalya very crowded uh, very chaotic um maybe so uh, there are a lot of uh, very different uh, city uh, cultural city and the woman uh, start to and uh, yes uh, start to uh, work a job uh and to open the new area in the uh, at the woman uh, and the, a lot of problems started because uh women save ever money at uh, this money uh, same at the same time and uh, maybe powerful woman and uh, this is because of the um crisis of masculinity and uh, generally I want to see um, the maybe and yeah, I want to this. Yeah, you look the. Um, I shared my page, but how? How can this? I can share my page now. Yes, if you press share screen at the bottom, you should be able to. Oh, okay. This. Uh, yes, I can share. Um, I can. You look my. We my can only see a little bit of it. We can just see the top of the PowerPoint. Oh. I can't see it. So sorry. Ah, you look this. You look this Turkey? Okay. Uh, I want to again speak. Yes, this is thy woman. Yeah, this. This is the very crowded area. Again, this and this. The solo, thy, thy woman is this area. You look. And it, generally, this metropolitan city is the, a lot of women die. Because 
this area, in this area, women go to the work. And in this area, women not go to the work. Women at home generally is this area, but patriarchy is so deeply this area. And then maybe west, and not west, the east Anatolian area. Okay? And it's so big problem for Turkey. And the, I want the major rapist is the mar woman murders. I look maybe. Uh, the the two faces of media in these days. Yes, media is so important woman right. Uh, yes, we need the media, but same time media and the um uh, feeds the violence with the, its language. Because um product a new uh, violence language with the media, especially commercial media this is. And the other hand we are very angry to media, but on the other hand, we need the, this media because a lot of women look to media and the, uh, this woman wake up the, this human rights and the, this woman right same time. And uh, maybe again, and the, she draw attention to the insanity emphasized at the media generally. Uh, not uh, men, we can see the problem. Is the only insanity emphasized at the media is the making the perpetuous invisible and the language that the limited size the murders. For example, Erdogan uh, said the, a woman killing. No matter we are our children goes to that like that either the drummer or the zornist, you know zornist who is left alone. And the you know police chief police department, you know uh, Jalalatin Jarra, you know, maybe, and they uh, say that uh, women or the maybe girls not go to the street is the at night. Say that why say that? Because is the very um, hot problem is the maybe Munevar Karabulut. Killing is a very big and a very huge problem in the Turkey's killing woman killing problem. And after the Minerva Karabulut uh, murdering, uh, woman woman uh, movement is the huge area. In the high school, Minerva Karabulut high school students was the murdered by you know with the Jam Garibolu. Jam Garibolu is the so rich family. Uh, on the 3 March, in the, uh, and the, this news murder attacked the attention of the people and brought out and the many responses by the public. You, after I looked at this picture in the media, violence or magazine? General media, this uh, used a uh, photograph like a magazine. Or like a lifestyle picture, you look the you um, write to Minerva Karabulut at the Google. Only yes, saw the, this picture. You can understand this is the killing uh, case. No, generally like a, a magazine uh, case. Like understand. And uh, insanity is uh, generally uh, at the media. Insanity emphasized in the news about the femicides, making the perpetrators invisible and the language that the limit size the murders. When you look at the headlines of insanity in their names, it's as uh, there is a madness constantly killing women. This is Jeanette, maybe Turkish woman now. And uh, after again, a madness, not madness, generally denied insanity, insanity, everywhere insanity, not, not man. Is the real uh, guilty, not man, maybe, or the uh, yeah, insanity is the problem only. Yes, and uh, after uh, I want to talk about the uh, journalists, women journalists. 
uh, talk about the, this problem. We don't use the insanity, say that. Uh, give a letter about, yes, open letter from the journalist and um, murder, not madness. And because the problem is the, um, yes, man, yes, problem, really problem, man and the murder patriarchy and the killing is the so politic talk about and uh, this is the so so big problem and uh, you know at uh, the totally 527 women is died this year 1920 yeah and uh, there are female journalists in the media talk about the game yes uh, generally um, women in the media but uh, media role is the sole problem is the for the woman because you're a journalist you maybe write about the news in the uh, as a journalist in turkey but you don't have a power generally powerful position uh, in city generally man journalist you can not make a decision as about the news a uh, generally uh, make a decision by man journalist okay uh, and the woman journalists uh, write about the which department work in the turkey lifestyle magazine maybe healthy maybe economy uh this enough uh, the generally critical department journalism department uh, work again man journalist not woman generally man journalist and the uh, woman journalists like a showcase in the turkey maybe i want to continue maybe this our women are still a showcase uh these lose their job when they try to exist with the, their ideas yeah you have an idea as a woman journalist maybe uh, your boss fire your job maybe you know this woman uh Mengü, Banu Güven. this is so powerful uh woman journal at the turkey but these these women not now in the tv why why that there are not that tv because talk about nation because talk about Banu Yuan, uh, but journal men journalists want to want to nation talk about only like a showcase. Banu Yuan talk about only like a showcase uh, female. On they want only female. They don't want to woman journalist. You can understand. I don't know. And maybe again some female journalists who make their voices also try to silence the by love yes love like a new weapon the weapon at the for women journalists and melissa Atan, you know melissa Atan name i don't know but it's a successful female journalist you generally who reads and the newspaper a lot of time uh, she work in there and who covers right oriented names generally uh, and uh, uh, generally he was uh, punished for the shame the social media and uh, six year ago only six year ago only and the picture you know in the name rules uh, uh, celebrating as a journalist the name rules celebrating is the uh, legal in the turkey but uh, sharing the, a picture now is the terrorist attack like a love and maybe you know turkish journalism is a big in the persecuted on charge of spreading terrorist propaganda over the air photo from yes 2019 uh, uh, nevruz uh, celebration in the city of diyarbakir she uh, legally took a trade the social media in the in this month cities is the flag is the flag problem generally uh, of the terrorist organization say that but same area john dundar a lot of men uh journalists in there but only this uh 
Melis Alpen problem for the government. Why? Because Melis talk about the human right and they talk about the woman right in the Turkey. Talk about and not writing and the woman rights uh, movement in the Melis. And uh, generally, you know uh, Aisha? This is Aisha Shine, you know? Aisha is the Evrensel newspaper writer. Uh, generally, is the uh, so active uh, journalist is, is the source in media, and that these days is the um, talk about the Boğaziçi uh, movement, and the, a very active journalist regard the protest at the Boğaziçi campus. Police read that the likes house a Zoom meeting, and the one day, one night, is the uh, state at the police department, police office. Uh, these days, uh, but why? Because police say that is the uh, so problem. Your social media talking, only social media talking, no uh, news, uh, no writing, and understand. And the uh, everywhere with um, invisible, uh, and the so uh, so so big problem. The poor woman. No talk about, no write about in the social media, your idea. Uh, but how can we do? We are journalists. We want to share our, our, our idea. <laughs> Again, is the last, you know, uh, talk, you talk about this uh, maybe. And uh, we're old newspaper uh, journalists in the Turkey. Is that there are, yes, in the jail, two women. Uh, even though their punishment is over, they are still in, yes, and the prison still. Unfortunately for uh, for them, both of the not uh, national or the international community are silent, I think that. Because, for example, for the Melis, PEN, and the, in Turkey, in the Melis, media and law community in the Turkey, uh, uh, generally advocate your rights, uh, they, uh, sh uh, her rights, Melis and Aishan, but uh, same uh, society don't talk about uh, these women. It's a double discrimination, I think that. If you are, um, yes, if you are maybe, for example, only this woman um, work at the Zaman newspaper because of a lot of people um don't talk about this this woman's rights mm -hmm. it's a very very, very big problem we are running a little bit low on time but thank you so much dr karagas for yeah. pointing out differences that are used in the language of the media um particularly i i appreciated when you said that women are restricted to certain areas in the field but they're not allowed to exist within their own objectives um thoughts and work um so thank you so much for your presentation up next we have Zeynep Özdemir, who is a high school junior at Fulton Science Academy Private School. She is committed to voicing injustice whenever she can. And in this regard, she has been working on projects for the CSW for the past three years. In her own time, she loves learning new languages. Go ahead, Zeynep. Thank you. All right, so good afternoon. Um, my name is Zeynep Özdemir, and I'm very honored to be here today. Um, so the brilliant speakers who on this panel before have talked about the particular difficulties that journalism, um, women in journalism face. And today I want to talk about how women's uh, misrepresentation in Turkish media is an issue and why this is detrimental to the lives of real women. And also be touching on the role of social media in raising uh, public awareness about women's rights violations. So before jumping into the specifics, let's take a look at some global statistics regarding the presence of women in media. So according to a Harvard Business Review, we found out that women only appear in a quarter of television, radio, and print news. And in a 2015 report, women made up a mere 19% of experts featured in news stories and 30% of reporters telling stories globally. So even casual observers will have noticed this general absence or negative portrayal of women in many of the shows, um, movies, news, articles, and ads that we consume on a daily basis, regardless of the language or country. So we see that this 
uh, well, this is a well-documented global phenomenon. However, why is this representation important to study, you might ask? Because it affects not only how others see us, but how we perceive ourselves. And particularly in Turkey, women are generally underrepresented in roles and the roles that they do have reinforce gender inequality. So in many movies and films, we saw women play the role of either a housewife or a person under the control of an abusive individual, such as their love interest or another man. And often women fall in love with their kidnappers and are portrayed either as stereotypically manipulative or just entirely naive. Their roles tend to be defined by their relationships with men instead of by their own selves. And moreover, there's an obsessive focus on the virginity of females and their roles as mothers or caretakers um, who are ready to sacrifice almost everything for others. Now, I'd like to analyze two specific shows full of this mis misrepresentation violence. An incredibly popular show, which represents a problematic yet a very common view of women, is The Pit. Uh, which is about a neighborhood run by a soul family and it shows their struggles against criminal enemies. And ironically, the show tries to push a socially conscious, conscious message that even as it disregards its own sexist tropes. For example, the family beats up a man in the neighborhood who has been ab abusing his wife. And of course, in this lawless world, even justice is in the form of more violence. Um, none of the women in the family are allowed to work or pursue an education, and instead, they're mostly limited inside the home. And when the main character's um, main character wants a divorce, her husband threatens the lawyers and ordered his gang to constantly follow her. So they basically control her life. And this brings us to the main issue, that not only do these production, productions represent these repressive acts as one, uh, ones of love, but they also normalize abuse against women by constantly showcasing them. Another highly rated show is Selamat Karadinis, or You Tell Me Black Scene English. So this, uh, this show was advertised as an anti-domestic violence production, and it drew on the public's awareness of domestic violence as a huge problem. So any, any reasonable person would tell you that it perhaps did more harm than good. So in the show, the main character, Nifis, she's been sexually and physically abused for eight years by her husband, who she was sold to uh, by her father when she was a teenager. And after 22 attempts, she finally escapes with her son. And this all just happens in the first episode. This is where the first episode begin. And instead of focusing on her recovery, we see extended scenes of gratuitous violence and helpless women. In one of the episodes, there were 20 minutes of ongoing violent, physical violence and 41 minutes of psychological abuse towards the female character. And moreover, the show also has fault for representing her as a typical damsel in distress. She can't appeal to authorities and try to establish a better life for herself. And instead she's uh, rescued by an initially reluctant hero who soon falls madly in love with her and tries to protect her from the abuser. And even worse than this, just about every single female character in the show becomes acquainted with the abuser and is assaulted as well. Um, one of the sisters is forced into marriage and raped, the other is left paralyzed and mute. Not to worry though, most of the time they're saved by their husbands or other potential love interests. And these rapes, these beatings and psychological violence towards these women are shown in length and in detail. And ironically, this show, this show is supposed to be anti-violence. However, it has very little consideration as to the harm that such graphic depictions would cause in a population that's already used to gender violence and stereotypes. And these shows only make up a small percentage of the actual films that include domestic violence in Turkish cinema. Here are some others. And of course, one can argue that um, TV shows are simply a representation of a wider cultural context. But what good does it do if we just allow these to be seen and say nothing? And this is why we were curious about Turkish people themselves, and what they thought about this representation, whether even uh, whether they knew about this issue. So we created an online survey with a sample that consisted of Turkish women and men of varied ages living in multiple countries, including Greece, Turkey, uh, Germany, and Poland. We analyzed 
um, about 120 responses to see what they thought about misrepresentation of women in media. So for instance, when we asked, how do you think women in Turkish TV series are represented? Um, the responses vary greatly more between every age group rather than by gender. So if we see here, the majority of uh, the responses who were age zero to 16 responded that they, uh, the women needed men as their saviors or they were weak um, or they were financially dependent to males and much more. Majority of um, responses aged from 17 to 25 um, stated that the woman was in love with love or under the control and will of a male character or strong. Majority of um, responses aged 26 to 40 said modern in terms of external view, traditional in terms of gender roles or sexual object. And then um, majority of the answers aged 41 to 65 reported ambitious and scheming character. So our analysis suggests that female characters have, play one of two extremes. They're either weak and in need of male protection or they're manipulative and scheming single dimensional characters running after either men or uh, money. We further asked whether or not they think women are underrepresented and could be represented better. And the results show that a little more than half agree that women are underrepresented. We also included the following statement to remind our uh, the people to be part of the solution. We said, we can bring positive change by not only watching shows that misrepresent women, but also not supporting the producers who produce them. And to this, over 70% of people agreed with the statement. So of course the events presented, uh, represented in these Turkish TV shows draw some extent from real life in Turkey. Turkey has a devastating gender violence and abuse and femicide problem. According to the We Will End Femicide platform, 300 women were killed in 2020 alone. And of these deaths, 97 were committed by their husbands, 54 by the men they were with, 38 by acquaintances, 21 by their ex-husbands, 18 by their sons, 17 by their fathers, 16 by their relatives, and eight by the people they were with previously. Um, five by their brothers and three were just someone that they didn't know. So we see that the lives of Turkish women are constantly at risk in a patriarchal nation that places more importance on the innocence of men than rather than um, rightful freedom of women. So complaints are sometimes ignored by the police or restraining orders against abusers are not effectively enforced. And in other instances, perpetrators of violence against women are released soon after detainment or even worse, given a sentence reduction for their good behavior. And in response, Turkish women have taken hold of the social media as a means of power. Sometimes that's the only way they can search for justice. And we, our group argues that social media is the useful platform um, in an environment where government takes very little responsibility. For example, let's take a look at the example of Shula Chet. She was 23 in 2018. Uh, she was a college student at the time, and Chatay Aksu, her boss, had fired her, but he invited her back to the building on May 31st, claiming that he would rehire her. And his friend, Bak Akhan, was also there. And later that night, he texted, Shule texted her friend saying, uh, call me and say that you need me back for an emergency. And at 2 a.m., she texted her again, I can't leave. The man is obsessed with me. He won't let me go. And soon, Autopsy reports show that she'd been raped. However, um, Aksun Akan tried to frame her murder as a suicide. So her murder led to a huge social media reaction when it made the news. On one side, there were those discussing why she was out so late or what her sexual history was. But fortunately, people didn't let the case go and the hashtag justice for Shuda Chet trended all over the world. And this mass attention um, that built up created pressure against the government to investigate the case. And after a series of hearings, uh, Bak Akhan and Chatayaks was finally sentenced. And after being sentenced, he said that he was arrested solely because of social media pressure. And this admission puts on perspective how much social media actually matters in Turkey and how it can impact the actions of decision makers. More recently, Ibrahim Zaraf, uh, Zaraf he beat his wife, ex-wife near, near death outside her apartment while their five-year-old child was watching. And this attack was captured on video by the neighbors and it was online on March 7th. The victim's sister, she said that 
um, she on social media, she said that uh, they had reported Ibrahim to the police countless times, but he was never punished. Um, and this video was seen about by just about everyone on social media and an outpouring of support from celebrities and the public ensued. And Turkish Minister of Justice Abdülhamid Gül, he tweeted that the abuser had been arrested and the investigation had been started about the incident. He said that the law will do what is necessary. The abuser will not get away with this. And similar messages came from other government officials. And while it is upsetting that we could just be assured of justice only after the violence occurs, and only if a woman is able to make her voice heard on social media, these events do go to show that social media has an important impact on outcomes. And as concerned individuals, we should use this power of social media to create this pressure against governments to enact proper legislation and um, on media platforms to accurately represent women. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Zainab. And I personally had even seen some of the shows that you mentioned, but I didn't know how um, prevalent the subjects that you were talking about were. And I think it's important to know what we watch. So thank you for your presentation. We're now gonna be moving on to the Q&A session. And I have some questions here that have been sent in throughout the panelists. So we're gonna get started with a question for um, Professor Kieran. Can you tell us about what your organization is doing regarding the demonstrations in Ankara today? I think you're muted again. This this almost every time happens, so I should you know. Um, so um, so today, as you know, that uh, the demonstration took place. Um, I think it's dissipating now, um, and we uh, our our researcher Jaron Ishkit was there um, to document and just to be present to see um, if any kind of violations are taking place, which is something that we do. Um, uh, if uh, during court cases and demonstrations, we monitor the situation on the ground as well as keep an eye on any kind of violations that are taking place uh, out of sight. Um, so we were just there doing that, and um, um, our our researcher Jaron got attacked by the police um, mm -hmm. while covering that and documenting uh, just the demonstration. Uh, that during the demonstrations there has been a lot of violence that police carried out against the demonstrators, which is a regular. Um, event um, just a while ago on Women's Day, as you know that there were demonstrations across Turkey, um, especially in the major cities, Istanbul and Ankara, where again, there was a lot of police with batons. Um, in fact, this year, police, um, both male and female came without uniforms as well, just to you know keep an eye on protesters. Right after that, there were 10 women um, the next day off, not on the day of demonstration, women were identified who were demonstrating um, uh, in uh, Istanbul. And then the next day their houses were raided and 10 women were picked up um, from their homes by the police. Um, so I think that, um, I, I mean, I think we document um, cases of violations against women journalists, but obviously while doing that and while monitoring these cases, we come across, uh, you know, violations that are taking place against journalists in general, men and women, uh, LGBTQ community, as well as protesters, activists, politicians, uh, female politicians who are also violated. So I think that what we are seeing in the in the most recent um, years, especially, I was talking about post Darbe earlier, and I think that one thing that is going on is that we are seeing particularly targeting women um, because of two reasons. One, there is misogyny. Um, I think there was a lot of discussion dur today um, during this conversation. Some of you presented how women uh, are violated, and I think that sort of gives a map of the misogyny, the misogynistic culture. And then when women are violated, there are some, there is some documentation of that, but we, there's no detailed conversation within the country because it is not permitted in the media because media itself is 
also a misogynistic institution. So that creates, uh, you know, layers and layers of problems of what, how much, how widely women are targeted, and then how women in the media who are working and trying to document these violations, who care about this, who have context of this, they themselves are violated. There are lots of uh, women journalists that were discussed today by different panelists, and I want to say that all of those um, violations are documented by us. One of the things that we do is that while we know that this is difficult as an international organizations we we can uh we have um the kind of ability to be able to document each and every violation that takes place against fem a female reporter in the country um I, I, some of that comes from the safety we get from being you know an outside source in turkey as well because we see that a lot of inside sources like organizations research institutes they fa themselves face um backlash so that um, becomes a security issue for a lot of them. So, um, so I do want to say that, you know, to urge anyone who is interested in violations, particularly against women reporters to, to follow uh, the documentation that we're doing consistently. Also today, and this whole, I think the whole month of March, there has been a lot of cases of violations against women journalists in Turkey uh, in particular. And I would, I would urge you to follow our Twitter. Today we had, uh, I think one of the, Aish, you were discussing Aishan, um, Dr. Kisban, you were discussing Aishan as well. Um, and she, uh, today as well, she was, uh, there was a backlash against her on Twitter. Uh, we documented two attacks against women journalists today alone. So there's consist, this is happening every day. And I would say that, you know, uh, anyone who's interested, um, you know, in uh, understanding what kind of violations are taking place against women journalists in particular, um, to follow our Twitter where we update these uh, on a daily basis. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Nazish. And she did include some sources um, in the chat for the participants, if you guys would like to check that out. Uh, next, we have a question for Zehra. What has been the outcome of imprisoning these female journalists that you were talking about? Um, I think, as I've said before, uh, we are left with very few women in the field who can objectively and criti critically report the news. And we wanted to mention specifically um, to remind the world that these people these women that we have mentioned are not forgotten and that we value each and every one of them. Um, for example, like I said, Aisha and Puruldak, um, the last thing she said to us was that she was afraid that she would be forgotten in prison. And I feel like um, even us doing this program kind of brings attention and it shows the importance of the situation. Thank you so much, Zehra. Uh, next, we have a question for Dr. Karagas. Uh, in your opinion, what is the future for women in media? Uh, yes, future is a, you know, the media is a so change these days because after the ATP, uh, because the media is the hand, the other hand, uh, you know, and a lot of uh, newspapers um, closed and the new, uh, yes, and the new uh, TV and the new newspaper is the uh, handle the AKP uh, CEO. Uh, and the, but is the maybe new opportunity is the new media because uh, after the uh, um, maybe conventional media, uh, a lot of women, maybe Nevchin, Banu, and the Ahu, uh, maybe uh, these names. Uh, remember and the women's TV maybe open uh, a lot of women open the new media is the new uh, the digital uh, account and uh, uh, work the work maybe open the new uh, platform or for uh, journalists and again maybe beyond it you know uh, and the woman writes uh, newspaper like a digital newspaper for the woman rights and uh, this is the new opportunities and uh, and again maybe a european foundation give a um, yeah fund uh, for the women journalists for a news uh, and about the human rights and their women rights uh, maybe all of palme 
uh, and the European delegation and the, maybe Matra again. Uh, and the, this is good, uh, the good things in the Turkish. And the, but uh, at the same time in the risk, so risky area, it is, especially social media uh, for journal, uh, women journals, because a lot of um, sexist words they use the, for the women journals. Especially, you know, remember, and then uh, who is um, Nation Mengu target generally for the sexist world. Again, maybe the, a lot of women afraid the social media and the Twitter. Twitter uh, account is the source of problem for the women journalists. Not about the news. Generally, uh, this uh, she call, go to the court to for the social media message. Not news, for example. This is a very big problem. Yes, this opportunities. At this at the same time is a risk. Yeah, same time. And uh, but I want to say that uh, maybe after the uh, very uh, very big uh, darkness uh, days, uh, open the new opportunities uh, for the human rights and uh, maybe freedoms in the Turkey. But we have a uh, need uh, a lot of time, maybe two years, maybe five years. I don't know. Is the this day is the very hard? I think, especially women journalists. Thank you so much, Dr. Karagas. And I agree. Um, it definitely will be a difficult journey, but it's it's good to hear your positive um, perspective on the situation. Next, we have a question for uh, Zeynep Özdemir. We have. Uh, somebody asked, how exactly does the issues that you mentioned with misrepresentation apply in a wider global context? Uh, yeah, so I I did present two examples of positive social impact in Turkey cases, but uh, there is one example um, on a global scale. Maybe some of you have heard of the Me Too movement. So um, it was a movement against sexual harassment and sexual assault. And the phrase Me Too was um, used in 2006 by um, the sexual harassment survivor and activist Tarana Burke, um, who started the movement and um, with her sexual um, violence education for the black mi minority communities. So it supported disabled trans survivors of color working to lead events and other disabled trans survivors. Um, and it, it attracted more people in 2017. Um, and since then, it's just been providing a source of solidarity for women from all backgrounds who, is, who have experienced um, sexual harassment. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think I believe we are almost out of time. So we're going to start wrapping up right about now. Um, Let me interrupt you very quickly. Um, today we talked a lot about, you know, both issues of femicide, um, misrepresentation in the media, generally, you know, about women's issues that impact not only journalists, but women in, in general in Turkey. So as the um, organizer of this event, Advocates of Science Turkey is going to be holding a virtual protest uh, regarding these violations tomorrow uh, on Sunday. So I'm going to be dropping a link to the Twitter page with more information about how you can join that protest. Um, I know there were people in the chat, you know, who were so surprised by what they were hearing, but we're also interested in learning more. Uh, we would love to see you there as well. So there we go. That should be in the chat right now. Thank you for that information. Um, so we're going to be wrapping up our presentation for today. Thank you all for all of our guests for coming and those who are also watching from YouTube Live. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the support. Um, thank you for working to educate yourselves more on this topic, whether or not you knew about it previously or if you're learning about it for the first time. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, I believe that'll be all for today. Thank you so much. And thank you for our panelists for coming, um, for making time out of your busy schedules.